Center. I want to bring up Rich Heyman. He's the executive chairman and co-founder of Medicrin. It's a biotech startup developing new therapeutics for treatment of diabetes and fatty liver diseases. Previously, he was the co-founder of two San Diego-based biotech companies, both focused on discovering and developing next-generation therapeutics for hormone-dependent cancers. Uh, those had nice exits, it seems. Aragon sold to Johnson & Johnson in 2013. And uh, Gentech Roche purchased Saragon in 2014. Join me in welcoming me, Rich. I'd like to thank everybody and kick off the life science section. Um, and what I'd like to do, since uh, the organizers gave me the carte blanche to uh, really talk about um, life sciences and my experiences in life sciences, I'd like to basically focus a little on San Diego, uh, the biotech sector, uh, and really focus on maybe three or four major topics. One, just give you a little background on myself and my experiences over the last 30 years, both in academics in San Diego as well as the life science community. Um, I think one of the things that we've heard in general is the importance of the interface with academia. And I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the, the network of academic institutions in the San Diego community. And uh, I think it was touched on in the last section, but I'll focus a little on that. I'd like to give you maybe two examples of some new companies that have been spun out of two different academic centers in the San Diego community. Uh, very different models from a biotech perspective, but I think very, very interesting and both well-funded companies. And the last thing that I'd like to just uh, uh, talk a little about is uh, the use of genomics, of course, in the life science industry and, and data and the strength of the, uh, the genomics company uh, genomics companies in the San Diego community. So maybe as a, a little background on myself, um, I went to graduate school in Minnesota uh, about 30 years ago. And uh, after five brutal winters in Minnesota, I decided I needed a change. Uh, and Southern California was a good opportunity to get away from the cold. I ended up doing my postdoc at the Salk Institute. If any of you have been to the Salk Institute, it's a uh, absolutely amazing architectural feat uh, designed by Lewis Kahn shortly after uh, Jonas Salk uh, discovered the polio vaccine and he had the opportunity to basically go throughout the United States uh, and choose a place to set up a research institute and he chose it in La Jolla overlooking the bluffs uh, of uh, the Pacific Ocean. And it, it's just a, a been a remarkable place uh, both for me personally and I had the opportunity more recently to go back and join the board um, vice chairman of the Board of Trustees at the SOC, but it's really a wonderful research institute. Um, and my wife always jokes that I'd probably still be a postdoc uh, at the institute even 25 years later, if not for a little uh, deal that we had uh, agreed upon, and that was if we ever had kids, I'd have to get a real job. Um, and so about 25 years ago, uh, my son was born, and uh, fortunately, the, the lab that I was doing research in uh, had made some major breakthroughs in the area of hormone-dependent signaling pathways, uh, started a biotech company, and uh, I had the opportunity to kind of go to the dark side, right out of academia and into a, a biotech community. Uh, and it, I've been in that San Diego biotech community for the last uh, 20 plus years. It's been a, a wonderful opportunity for me. Um, and I've had the uh, luxury in terms of the great scientific talent, both not only locally, but throughout the country, of working with uh, wonderful professors to basically build business models in the life science community. And I'll, I'll give you maybe one or two quick examples. Um, uh, about seven or eight years ago, I was contacted by some VCs, one of which was up in the Bay Area, and a professor from Memorial Sloan Kettering in uh, New York um, on the potential of starting a company focused on hormone-dependent cancers, in particular, uh, prostate cancer. And for those of you not that familiar with these type of cancers, uh, just a little background. Uh, unfortunately, one in six men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer over time, and it's about the same number uh, for women. 80% of these cancers are driven by the male or the female reproductive hormone. So in the case of men, of course, it's androgen or testosterone. In the case of women, 
it's uh, estrogen, the primary female reproductive hormone, and the tumors become addicted to uh, these hormones. And we had some insights uh, that if we could interfere with these signaling pathways, we might be able to develop next generation therapeutics. And so uh, it went from would I do diligence for the VCs and the academics to would I write a business plan and I got sucked into becoming the CEO of a company which we called Aragon uh, about seven years ago. We were able to discover a class of drugs that targeted in men uh, the male reproductive hormone. It blocked their activity. Uh, and we brought it into clinical trials. The good news was literally in the first six patients that we had treated, we, we got responses. So we knew that the drug was active. Uh, we originally raised, and it's contrary to uh, kind of the public days today, we only raised $8 million for a life science company. That's not a small amount of money. That, that is a small amount of money. Today, people are raising 50 to $100 million, even in their Series A uh, raises. Uh, the good news was that we uh, were able to raise some additional money. We brought our compound into a phase two clinical trial, about 100 patients, and we had a very, very strong response rate. But again, those of you in the life science community or in the venture community realize that to conduct a pivotal registration trial, we needed to raise about $120 million just to conduct our, our pivotal registration trial. Uh, it was about 1,200 patients, and it was another three to four years to a readout. So uh, we s I sat down with the board. We had a second program in the context of breast cancer, um, also targeting these hormone-dependent cancers. And we decided to explore the following uh, interesting, I think, business model, which we referred to as the buy spinco model. Could we identify a pharma company that was interested in our lead asset, which was our prostate cancer asset, um, that they would be interested in acquiring the entire company, but I would able perhaps would be able to negotiate out our second program. And that's what we actually did. So we were able to sell the company to Johnson & Johnson. Um, they were only interested primarily in the prostate cancer assets. So we literally sold the company on a Friday. We terminated the employees on a Friday. Uh, we created a new co over the weekend. We had to change the name of the company. We called it Saragon, and I'll come back to the name uh, in a moment. I invited everybody back on Monday and we started Saragon, only focused on the uh, breast cancer program. Um, good news was that some of the companies that were actually interested in our entire company, Aragon, reapproached us and said, well, we really like the second program, your breast cancer program. And literally a year later, we sold the company to Genentech and Roche. So in the context of uh, literally one year, we sold one company to J&J and we sold the next company to Genentech and Roche. <coughs> I was particularly interested uh, in the previous uh, presentation on media uh, because all of a sudden some of the individuals started talking about the jargon AR, VR, MR. I didn't even know what they were talking about, but one of the biggest challenges in starting a life science company is how do you come up with the right name? And so we struggled to come up with the name so when they were talking about AR and VR, I thought they were talking about life sciences because the goal of Aragon when we started the company was that we wanted to get rid of the target of androgens. The target of androgens, the male reproductive hormone, is the androgen receptor, AR. So for five, six years, we always talked about AR. And what did we want to do with AR? We wanted to get rid of it, gone. Aragon, get rid of the receptor. So when the media folks were talking, I said, wow, they're talking my language. <laughs> and then when we started the company Saragon, just as a little aside, it was for selective estrogen receptor, S-E-R, gone. It's probably the hardest thing that everyone has to do is come up with the name of a company. Uh, but after we sold Aragon and Saragon, I kind of decided for me personally, and I think this focuses on the southern California, San Diego biotech community, that I love startup companies. I love the interface between academia, between the VCs and building the team. And so I'd like to share with you uh, kind of two biotech companies that I've gotten involved in. And it's really because of my involvement, probably in the academic community. I'm on the board at the Salk Institute, as I mentioned. I'm also on the board at the UCSD Cancer Center. And uh, I also have close ties to the Scripps Research Institute. 
One of the lovely things about the San Diego biotech community is that literally those three institutions, as well as a few other academic institutions, are walking distance from each other, if you like to walk, and I do. Um, and it really creates a, a strong proximity to uh, the entrepreneurs who have helped start companies, uh, the entrepreneurs at the university and the academic uh, institutions um, you know, within San Diego. So it's a huge plus, and I, I, I plug San Diego because I'm a fu huge fan of the uh, academic institutions. But just two quick examples of some companies that I've been involved in, and then I'd like to turn it over to the broader panel. Uh, I was able to help start a company called Metacrine, which um, was alluded to. It's some technology out of the Salk Institute, a professor named Ron Evans. Uh, and it's focusing on a particular disease. So in this model, we had a target that we felt was very, very important in the context of a disease called fatty liver disease, or NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Many of you probably haven't heard of it, but actually it, aff it affects about 20 to 25 percent of probably all the people in this room and in the United States. It's contributory towards many aspects of liver disease, ultimately leading to cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, and, and complexities with regards to morbidity and mortality. Uh, we had a mechanism that we felt could target this ter ter terrible disease. Uh, we licensed some technology out of the Salk Institute. I actually took some of my Aragon Saragon team, and we started a company called Metacrine. So it's what I would call kind of a target-based focused approach, identifying a target, mining it from a small molecule perspective, and ultimately, hopefully, uh, raising enough money to bring uh, compound ultimately to human clinical trials. I'd say much more of a traditional biotech type approach. The second company I'll just briefly mention is very, very different. It's much more of a platform-based approach. And you hear a lot about genomics these days. Well, what, are, what is genomics? It's obviously the basic blueprint of our body, which gives rise to certain proteins. We have on the order of about 20 to 30,000 proteins in our body. Only about 10% of those proteins to date have been targeted from a drug discovery point of view. But that doesn't mean that the other 90% are not important from a human health perspective. There's some technology out of a lab named uh, Ben Kravat's lab at the Scripps Research Institute, and he's approached and developed technology to target many of these other 90% of the genes, the proteome, which in effect are tapping the undruggable proteome. So it's these type of technologies that we feel will offer opportunity to treat a wide variety of different diseases, Alzheimer's, um, cancer, and many, many other approaches. Big platform approach, need a lot of money. So the VCs did fund it with a $40 million Series A financing a little over a year ago, but we realized we needed quite a bit more money, so we did a partnership literally nine months into the company where Celgene came in and gave the company $100 million to really put a uh, foot on the pedal to, to the metal to really advance these type of technologies. So I think it's an other type of model that's very, very important as we think about the type of capital that we need to crack some complex issues. And, and again, just another example of some technology out of an academic institution in San Diego, which I think is very, very exciting. And maybe in closing, um, I, I think the proximity as I mentioned, of the academic institutions to, to each of their own allows for tremendous collaboration amongst the institutions. And as was alluded to in the last presentation, uh, there's a cluster of folks uh, that work on the biotech sector, very, very adjacent to the universities. And we all talk about the need for capital. We all need capital. Life sciences is a very capital intense approach. But I should point out that perhaps early in my career, uh, you know, the key focus of capital was up here in the Silicon Valley, Menlo Park, San Francisco, and in the Boston community. But I'd have to say, I just want to remind people that uh, the shift in financing is really changing quite incredible, incre incredibly, in, in, at least in my experience in the last few years. There's tremendous capital coming out of New York, and there's actually a tremendous amount of capital coming out of Asia as well. And in some of the companies that I've been involved in now, we've uh, obtained probably 60 to 70 percent of our funding out of New York-based groups, not the traditional VCs, but some private equity groups and, and other companies that are interested and willing to fund life sciences, and a tremendous amount of capital coming out of Asia. 
uh, and uh, I think there are interesting opportunities to exploit there as well. Last comment I'll make is uh, one of the underpinnings, we talked a little about uh, Qualcomm, we talked about some of the life science communities, but uh, also the uh, impact of genomics, of course, is very, very important in companies like Illumina, Thermo Fisher, and many of the startups and spin-outs that they've uh, developed uh, are based in San Diego uh, as well. Uh, obviously, data, 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 so you need that interface. That's going to be very, very important. Some of that's, of course, up here, and the need for collaboration between data, AI, and basically the whole genomics revolution, I think, is going to be key in the future. So hopefully I've given you a little feel, obviously a bias towards uh, San Diego and Southern California. In fact, a lot of times I don't even use the word Southern California, I use San Diego. Um, I think it's interesting today, you know, we obviously talk a little about Northern California, the LA focus and San Diego, but there is a need to uh, continue to collaborate amongst uh, all of life sciences in the California area. So. I'll stop there and I'll uh, ask the rest of the panel to come up and kind of